Hey everyone, this is Alex Lean, and you are listening to Two Guys Talking Rush. Two guys, two guys are talking rush. Two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking rush. Two guys are talking rush. Two, two guys, two guys are talking rush. Rush, rush, two guys. And now, get ready for the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast with your hosts, John Kane and Dan Buxman. Hey folks, my name is John Kane and this is the delightful Dan Buxman and welcome to episode 34 of the Two Guys Talking Rush podcast. It's not two guys talking Andy Gibb. It is not. It's two guys talking the incredibly iconic Rush. So listen in, folks, and discover the best damn Rush podcast in the entire Solar Federation. Two guys talking Rush! (laughs) Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sorry. Exactly. I don't know why that... Did that voice exist before that guy did that? I was not aware of it until specifically those monster truck and tractor pulls happened. K-Tel might have had something to do Maybe. with that. Yeah. That's, that's possible. <laughs> K-Tel, you know, Mr. Microphone, that sort of stuff, I guess. Yes. Yeah. This emphatic, exaggerated, happy voice to sell you something you don't want. Buy several. <laughs> buy, 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 buy. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Well, hey, another episode 34. We're just, ra- we're just sort of just racking them up here, two guys talking rush. Um, and uh, we're glad to be uh, here with uh, our many listeners, all three of you who are listening. No, no. We're, we're, doing little, we're doing a little better than that. No, we are. I think we've almost crested. I just wanted to use that this way. Very nice. Uh, at uh, uh, We're cresting at uh, 20,000, I think. Downloads. That's, For, more, that's more than three people. That's more than three people. Yeah. And it's almost, well, not quite. My math is bad. I didn't really succeed, succeed at math in high school and, and, and thereafter. But uh, it's maybe it could we could be teetering. Again, teetering and cresting. Very nice. Uh, yeah, thank you. At uh, 10,000 an episode? No? 1,000 an episode. What? See, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what's good yeah, I don't need for that. something like this. So, I don't know. I, I don't so if the number is higher than it was last time, I don't know. then it's good. 2,500 an episode. Yeah, I mean, the Maybe. analytics on these things, it's hard to... It's hard to know, but there are people listening. We get emails from them mm-hmm. uh, and um, hate mail. I'm just kidding. I haven't got one. I haven't got one angry person we might have gotten a couple of people who are like maybe fix this little thing or something yeah. like that but we haven't gotten anybody who's just been like oh my god where do you get off to even doing this Ugh. you know we haven't had anything like that no uh which uh good i'm i am pleased i imagine somewhere out there we annoy somebody, somebody. And I, yeah yeah i bet you i annoy somebody and you annoy somebody but you know it's, yeah. it's an imperfect world, I guess. Well, hey, listen, folks. Remember, uh, this show is hosted by fans. Yes, Dan and I are true Rush fans. Yep. Four fans. And our listeners know we are inclusive. Each week, we try and mix it up with guests and good content. And we want fans, that's you, to join us on this magnificent journey. Uh, before I forget, I want to thank uh, our guest on episode 33, pioneer Rush blogger, Ed Stinger. What a great episode that was. Yeah. Got a lot of feedback on that episode, actually. People really uh, liked it a lot. And I imagine we'll have Ed back on to talk about stuff. Yeah, I mean, he, he's the guy, as far as I'm concerned. So, yeah, it's, it was getting him was great. He's on the list. He's on the list. He sure is. Well, here at Two Guys Talking Rush, uh, we support uh, the talented crews who make up the live event and touring industry. So please support the Sweet Relief Musicians Fund at sweetrelief.org. A small donation will help thousands of music industry people who have been affected by COVID-19. The Sweet Relief Music Musicians Fund provides financial assistance to all types of career musicians and music industry workers who are struggling to make ends meet while facing illness, disability, or age-related problems. In other words, healing musicians in need. We all have received so much out of music uh, and these folks, so it's time to give back. And, and this includes the Rush 
cruise as well. I mean, think of how many rush tours there were, how many, you know, shows, uh, individual uh, uh, sort of aesthetics that were involved with lighting and, and, and production elements. Uh, the, even right down to the folks who are shaking those giant bunnies on the Presto tour, mm -hmm. the inflatable bunnies, you know, these people are out of work. They're doing other things and who knows how they'll re recover, how this industry will recover. Uh, in the meantime, throw, throw a couple bucks at them if you yeah. can. Definitely. Uh, well, anyway, uh, you can hear our podcast on TuneIn, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Simplecast, and others. This show is recorded in video, so please check out our YouTube channel and click subscribe. Do it now. A quick Rush Radio shout out. So um, you can find Rush Radio on the TuneIn app and at rushradio.org. Again, another thank you to Ed Stanger at rushasaband.com. Lots of good content, up to date news on Rush. Uh, we love that website a lot, as well as Power Windows. 2112.net check them both out folks um another shout out to the mighty why why not who just released i believe they've released their album. yeah i'm so bad with this i gotta buy their album they had signed copies white vinyl i'm like damn it i didn't do it but um, yeah, I, th I think those went already like I gone think they, history. they went through all those yeah see you later history uh so definitely uh, support why why not their music can be heard in our show's intro and and, and that's a lot of fun uh rush fans we want to hear from you if you have comments suggestions ideas or questions about the show please uh submit them i uh, would like to hear from you email us at two two guys talking rush at gmail that's two TWO, not the number two. We're always looking for super fans. Our Rush fan, super fan spotlight is ongoing. Uh, what is a super fan? What makes you a super fan? Uh, you know, again, what, what, would, what would be the ideal super fan to you, Dan? Uh, just honestly, uh, there's a whole category of Rush fans uh, who I think even make up like possibly the majority of Rush fans who have seen them dozens and dozens of times yeah. and have you know have gone the whole extra mile that nobody goes for any other band yeah uh so yeah you know, i and i don't want to place limits on how many shows that has to be or anything like that no uh honestly the fact that they write in to us to me means they must be rush super fans sure yeah because yeah. if they if they have if they have room in their fandom for us yeah super fans in my opinion i suppose if you need to make time in your day every day for rush yes then you're a super fan right you, or you to... or if you need to make time in your day to like go to the bathroom and eat because all you're doing is listening to rush then you're there really a super fan yeah, that's <laughs> you a, are. Yeah. is I... your personal life suffering from <laughs> listening to too much rush <laughs> um my buddy uh, uh mike uh dear friend old school friend probably the biggest black sabbath fan i know uh takes if he's out and about and he doesn't have sabbath around him he needs to take a, he usually takes a sabbath break wow and goes and listens to sabbath and then comes back Jesus. Le legit 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 no, i'm not not even joking right now he's probably listening to sabbath Damn. he sent daily i receive texts about some old song or some video or something that he's inspired by for the day so like on, th on this day in 1973, absolutely, Tony absolutely. Iommi overdubbed something. Absolutely, absolutely. awesome. Okay. I know. Um, anyway, uh, our website is two www guys talking rush com t w o uh, two guys talking rush Facebook page facebook com slash two guys talking rush Twitter twitter com slash the number two guys talk rush and again subscribe to our two guys talking rush YouTube channel. Um, as a reminder, we receive no revenue from doing this podcast. If you feel like making a small uh, donation, do it. Uh, we have uh, many ways you could do that. Uh, one way is to go onto our website where you can acquire a coffee mug, T-shirt, button, sticker, or anything else. We also have a Patreon account, uh, www.patreon. I always feel like I say I'm saying it wrong. Is Patreon, Patreon? I say I say Patreon. Patreon. I think you're right. Yeah, I've heard Patreon. It's okay. Yeah. People, people know it's give us money. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're not talking big bucks. We're talking no, like no. a quarter a month. Anything. I don't know. Yeah. Anything to help us keep the show up, up and running and going and, and support our efforts. Uh, anyway, uh, Patri patreon.com slash two guys talking rush. Um, we got an email from a fan. Uh, we, we get them occasionally. Uh, and it says, uh, this is from Darren. He says, hello. I listened to the recent podcast with Ed Stinger, which is great. When I hear Dan speak, he sounds like Rick Nielsen of Cheap Trick. Take care and thank you for your time. 
wow is all i can say i'm a guitar player but this is the first time i've ever been compared to another guitar player for my voice that's never happened before that's i gotta say yeah. uh that that particular comparison has never been made i'll take it though uh he's a smart guy and he's a funny guy so i'll take it I'm when, pleased you, by when that. you play guitar dan do you do you whip out uh, uh, my five guitar net, picks? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, do you shoot? Do you like have machine gun uh, uh, guitar picks at the audience, like Rick Nielsen? Because he's I, constantly. I, I do not. I do not. But I do know somebody who uh, was the recipient of such a guitar pick at some like cheap trick concert in the eighties. And he would he would go around like showing it to people years later, like, look at this, nice. look at this. This is my cheap trick pick. Nice. So. I always I always tell you that when I was laid off in my early in my excuse me, my late twenties, for some reason I just was collecting unemployment and having a wonderful summer. Yeah, I bet. Shame, <laughs> shame on Sounds me. Sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, it, and I was legit looking for a job. Yeah. Anyway, it just wasn't working out, and uh, I was afforded the opportunity to to see a lot of small club shows. I saw the um, I saw um, Cheat Trick at Somerville Theater. And mm. was able to get them to sign all of them uh, live at Budokan, and then I was I was living in Salem and I was at a yard sale. No joke. I'm looking around. I'm I'm like a rummager. I look I'll look at something on a table, but I'll, if there's a box, I'll go in it and dig. Yeah. And I found a cheap trick uh, tour Dream Police tour uh, tour book. It's all signed, ballpoint pen all over the thing. I was like, cool. very nice. A couple bucks. Very nice. Yeah. Yep. So love, and I love Cheap Trick. I mean, just good rock yeah. and roll. Yeah. I mean, they're fantastic. Yeah. They are. Yeah. Just a lot of fun and super stuff. Anyway, uh, we uh, often cover Rush news and today in Rush history, this month in Rush history. Uh, in 74, Rush at Lara Secord Secondary School in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. In 1975, Rush at the Alibi East in Mount Pleasant, um, Missouri. In 1977, Rush. Out and the Outlaws at Louisville Gardens in Louisville, Kentucky. In 78, they play the Civic Center in Ottawa, Ontario on a Farewell to Kings tour. In 1980, they play the Arena in Winnipeg, Manitoba on the Permanent Waves tour. In 1982, they play the Barton Coliseum in Little Rock, Arkansas on the Signals warm-up tour. That must have been fun. And in 83, they play the Civic Center in Hartford, Connecticut on the Signals tour. In 1986, they play the second of two dates at the Brendan Byrne Arena in East Rutherford, New Jersey on the Power Windows Tour. Mystic Rhythms and Witch Hunt later released on a show of hands uh, that same year. And oh. then in 94, uh, Rush played the Civic Center in Peoria, Illinois on the Counterparts Tour. In 2011, Neil Peart's fifth book, Far and Away, a prize every time was published. In 2014, Swedish hardcore group Grace Will Fall's album, No Rush, was released, which not only punned Rush in its title, but the album cover is a tribute to Rush's 1974 debut cover. Ha ha. <laughs> there it is. Uh, uh, some Rush news. Uh, official L.E. Rush poster from Fantoons celebrating the 45th anniversary of 2112. Fantoons has just released a new officially licensed limited edition poster celebrating the 45th anniversary of Rush's 2112 album, which released was released in March 1976, although April 1st is incorrectly cited by many online sources. The 18 by 24 poster is printed on LaSalle fine art paper and is, and is, limited, is limited, limited copies. You can order yours via the official Fantoon shop. Uh, be sure to follow Fantoons on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all the latest updates and shop their complete line of official, official Rush merchandise at Fantoon Shop. Man, Fantoons has really jumped on the Rush bandwagon, huh? They're all over it. I'll say. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Good for them. Right. Good. Yeah, they figured right it on. out. Finally. Yeah, I know. I know, <laughs> right? Uh, Andy Curran on his upcoming side project with Alex Lyson in his new base magazine interview says, Coney Hatch frontman and former Anthem AR rep Andy Curran recently spoke with base magazine for a new interview to, to check in about what he's been up to during the lock lockdown and some current projects he's working on. Uh, he mentions a new studio project with Alex Lyson and Portland based singer songwriter Maya Wynn. Uh, I'm, he says, I'm also excited about the new studio project that features Maya Wynn, a young vocalist from Portland, Oregon. I played some of the songs Maya and I wrote together for Alex Lifeson, and he asked if he could be involved. I had to pinch myself during that call. We have seven songs completed with Alex, and Alex played on pretty much every one. Wow. 
one song was already mm. featured in the Netflix series Tiny Pretty Things, and we're planning a release, maybe uh, a cool NFT bundle. The band is called Envy of None, and is a and it is and it has a trippy, moody, ambient, sometimes evil pop vibe. Cool. So Alex is. I'm uh, happy to hear that uh, Alex is doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Keep it, you know what's he going to do? I mean, know, do, doing something wall. musical. I mean, yeah, I know. It's not to say that he doesn't do. I mean, things. there's only there's only so much wine drinking and golfing you can do. I mean, you gotta. He's still an artist, you know. He's still got to express himself. I, I had read something like a couple of months ago. Uh, you know, it was online, so I believed it, of course. Uh, but you know, I read, I read, and there was this one article where he, he was quoted as saying, like, you know, since Neil passed, we're just not, we're just not inspired. We don't want to make any yeah. music right now. I can certainly understand yeah. that being the case, but I'm happy to hear that there's been some movement for him. That's probably totally an essential part of you know getting out of the grieving process and that sort of thing. Totally. Um, Lifeson has collaborated with Wynn on a couple of past projects. Back in 2019, she released a single called Fearless Girl, which featured Lyson and the Portland Cello Group project. Uh, Wynn also sang on vocals on May 2019 collaboration between multi-instrumentalist Marco Miniman and Lifeson titled Lover's Calling, which Alex spoke about in his recent Mike Weird, Make Weird Music interview. Yeah, that was... Um, that was a great interview, that recent one. Uh, the Globe and Mail posted an article uh, on Sportsnet's recent edition, the recent decision to do away with a standalone radio broadcast of Toronto Blue Jays games and replace it with a simulcast called for both radio and TV. They asked seven prominent fans to weigh in on the decision, one of whom is Russia's Getty Lee, as we all know. Mm -hmm. Getty's uh, a major baseball fan. As most Rush fans know, Getty is a huge baseball fan and could often be seen sitting in his seats behind home plate at Toronto Blue Jays games. Here's what Getty had to say. <clears throat> Some of my most memorable baseball memories were not from sitting in the stands or watching the game on the tube, but listening on the radio. I mean, that's sort of synonymous with baseball, listening to baseball on the radio on a... Yeah. So warm summer day, you know, with a nice cold one. And with like the little rectangular transistor radio with the huge yes. antenna. Yeah, totally. Just getting baked in the sun, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, you mean ways, by, by the sun getting baked? <laughs> no, no, I, I retract. Um, so, so he says some of my most memorable baseball memories were not just from sitting in the stands or watching the game on the tube, but listening uh, to the radio, driving home from the cottage. I heard Dave Stibes, uh, heartbreaking first one hitter. There are nuances and descriptors that radio broadcasters share with their audiences that are simply not the same as a cable of TV announcers, no matter how good they are. It's a time-honored craft that requires a special ability to bring to life what we at home simply cannot see. This is a bad and regrettable decision. I agree. You know, there's an art. It's an art, just like just like an auctioneer. You know, like an auctioneer. Mm -hmm. you know, it's an art form. You know, this sort of dialect and, and all that. So, well, I mean, sports never suffered from it either, because you think of like some right. of the most famous sporting events of all time, like certain there, like some boxing matches and that sort of thing. It was there was only yeah. radio at the time, right. and everyone would be like crowded around the radio at the bar or wherever. Yeah. You know, listening to like oh you know. Uh, Cassius Clay punches again yeah. and he yeah. punches and and they're riveted you know mm -hmm. so it's nice when you can see but yeah. but yes it's an art form and it's sad that it's sailing into the sunset as it were I know I love radio I've always loved radio as a kid I still listen to radio every day I listen listen to the radio put it on somewhere in the car mm -hmm. or wherever you know uh Prague magazine posted a guide to the writings of Neil Peart this past week including their list of eight of his eight best books, topping their rankings was Pierce's 2002 book, Ghost Rider. That is a good yeah. one. Uh, following the double tragedy of losing his daughter, Selena, and his wife, Jackie, within 10 months of each other, Pierce set off on his BMW R1100GS on an epic 55,000-mile journey to try and find some solace. He rolled across Canada, the U.S., Mexico, and Belize, a ride Pierce needed to take in order to soothe his little baby soul and nurture and protect it as he best could amid what he called the wreckage of his life. Ghost Riders packed with journal entries, beautiful descriptions of flora, fauna, and landscapes, the food, Peart ate, the single malt whiskey he sipped, mostly McAllen, the places he stayed, and the letters he sent to his friend Brutus as he pushed forward on this journey. It's a tough read in places uh, due to the awful tragedy Peart endured, 
but his writing soars as he takes us with him down the healing road. Great book. I recommend it for anybody, even if you're not a Rush fan. Um, Kerrang! Magazine recently interviewed Voivod drummer and founding member uh-huh. Michael, Mike, Michael, Michel Away Langevin. Yeah to talk about the band's legacy and his current projects. The subject of Rush and Neil Peart came up at one point, and here's what Lang- Langevin had to say. Of course, uh, I, I cannot do a French accent here. so It's okay. Oui, oui, of course. <laughs> of course, I first started to hear Rush in the 70s. I didn't know who they were, but that voice and style was so distinctive, and I would hear them on the radio. When I started drumming, I studied the drumming very carefully, and I was impressed that their drummer had a concept going in this whole lyrical world that he had created. There were two drummers that impressed me that way. Christian Vander from uh, French avant-garde uh, prog group Magma and Neil Peart. I was trying to figure out his drum drum rolls and I couldn't. When I finally t- we finally toured with Rush in 1990 on the Nothing Face album, I was uh, at the side of the stage watching him and I still couldn't figure them out. Rush were really, really great to us and real gentlemen. After the first show we played with them, we went back to the dressing room and there was a bottle of champagne huh. from them for us with a note that we gave to Piggy immediately because he was the world's number one Rush fan. They were just so nice but we were really quiet because what I was meant to say, because what was I meant to, what was I meant to say to the professor? It's sort of like, yeah. 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 Uh, Total guitar published a six piece on the six of the most famous guitar chords in the history of rock this past week. And Alex Lifeson's hemispheres chord was mentioned one hit of this chord with some light distortion and chorus and you'll instantly be in the sonic territory of Russia's Alex Lifeson. Alternatively, play it around the fifth and seventh frets for a Jerry Cantrell vibe. Whatculture.com. Mm. Yeah, interesting. A um, lot of lists lately. A lot yeah. of, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, been, it's like the, it's, it's the year of the list. Yeah. Yes. Um, whatculture.com posted an article this pa- past week on the 10 rock albums that artists regret making and Russia's power windows oh, was included at number 10. Come on. What? I don't know. I know it's not everybody's favorite, but come on. There's no re- not- but regrets. I mean, the, come on. That's yeah. stupid. It's I'm not, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, right. It's not like Rush's ha- Rush hadn't dabbled in electronic music before this, though, with since being a prominent part of their sound since a farewell to Kings. Since it was the mid 80s, though, this is where everything in the kitchen sink is brought into the mix with Mystic Rhythms being the only thing that could be called a single from the record. While Neil Peart, Getty Lee were still willing to go down this road, these songs ended up hitting a sour note with Alex Lifeson with his signature guitar whales being pushed further and further into the background. Lifeson has always had a tense relationship with this record, oftentimes fighting with the rest of the band as to why he was looking for a different place when the keyboards were taking over. Despite returning to the loud guitars a few years down the road, Power Windows is still a powerhouse of a record if you're willing to look for a nice 80s throwback. Oh, man dissing on the power windows there we but have see, we have people yeah. on regularly who pick that yeah. album as one of their top five so whatever whatever this is saying no sorry it's true yeah. i think it's be i think it's sort of being rediscovered in some way because it's been pushed put down so much you know, like similarly to uh caress of steel you know for many years people just didn't like that album they've I all mean, held they've all held uh, up and there hasn't yeah. been there has not been one at least to my thinking where it's like yeah, yeah they really fucked up on that one it yeah. has not happened yeah. uh, there's maybe stuff we didn't like as much or whatever but there was never a time when it was like oh yeah whoa oh my god that's horrible you know it never happened yeah also it's kind of confusing me big money's on power windows yes right yeah and, big and money. it was so a that's... single yeah, it's, it, yeah that's, so that doesn't make sense to me. I don't know what that what's happening there. Quite a um, quite a popular single too. I might. Oh add. yeah, they play yeah. it live all the time. It's a yeah. it's 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 a great tune. I think that's yeah. a great tune. Um, Youdiscovermusic.com posted their list of the 25 greatest prog drummers of the past week, and Neil Peart came in at number two, behind only Bill Bruford. Thanks, uh, Bill Bruford, for knocking Neil out of the out of the pocket there. But that's okay. Awesome drummers. I can man. accept. You know, I can no accept question. that. Yeah. 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 All right. I get it. Uh, we're if not it was, just getting. If it was Tommy Lee. Maybe I might have a problem with it. <laughs> we're not. Uh... Oh, Tommy. I, just, I wonder if Tommy's a Rush fan. Uh, I, I, I like his drumming for what it yeah. is. But Very if, simple. But yeah. if he had, if he had beaten 
Neil Peart on the list of greatest prog drummers of all time, I would have had a, an issue with that. That would yeah. have, yeah, that would have bothered me. Yeah, yeah. he's uh, he definitely uh, is a hard hitter. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, says here, we're not just getting sentimental here. Even though Neil Peart's death in ter- early 2020 still hurts, the man was a brilliantly in- inventive drummer who transformed yeah. the band he was in, joining Rush when they were still a workmanlike hard rock outfit. Peart's various solos were just models of dexterity. They also had great riffs and even tunes. Uh, he also kept rhythm in mind while carefully choosing the words he'd use as, as a Rush lyricist. As a big fan of, uh, as a fan of big band jazz, uh, parenthetical, he produced two Buddy Rich tribute albums. Peart knew it, did, it didn't mean a thing if you couldn't make it swing. True. Uh, Last year, an Indonesian drummer named Didin Didin Noy began uploading videos to YouTube of himself performing drum covers by Dream Theater, Rush, and other rock bands. What set his drum covers apart was the fact that he used a homemade drum kit, but still managed to sound like a pro. He quickly became a viral sensation, and a crowdfunding campaign was started, the goal of purchasing Noy a professional kit. The campaign was unable to reach its goal of $1,000. And that's when drummer Mike Portnoy stepped in from Portnoy's Instagram page. Over the past weeks, I've gotten hundreds, maybe even thousands of DMs, messages, texts, tags, et cetera, from people all around the world, sending me links to uh, at Noy playing a lot of my songs on his homemade kit. His talents were indeed incredible. And I'm in the process of arranging to get him a new kit and cymbals with the incredible support uh, of official Tama drums and Sabian cymbals official. Uh, we'll keep you posted. That's at official Tama drums and at Sabian cymbals official. Uh, yeah, great. You can go, definitely go on uh, YouTube and check out Deed and Noise cover of Russia's Spirit of Radio on his makeshift kit. He's also done Limelight and Tom Sawyer, and they're pretty amazing. And that is pretty awesome. It's awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, you, you play on whatever pots and pans, a wall, your your belly. I mean, play the drums, you know. I mean, that's that's it. Well, uh, each show we have special guests, and uh, this week is like no other. Uh, we, um, you know, often leading up to, I think it was probably right before uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, books, several books were in the in the midst of being released about Rush. Uh, we had author Richard Houghton on, um, you know, a day in the a day in the life. I forget the the title of his book, but it's pretty much just fans that went yeah. to Rush shows, and and that was cool. Uh, our other uh, other author uh, Alexander Helene, who's on today's show, uh, uh, came out with a book uh, called Dreamers and Misfits: The Definitive Book about Rush fans. Uh, on November 23rd is when it came out. And uh, Alexander is uh, 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 an author uh, from New England and um, just a really nice guy. And um, as it says on his bio, it says, Alexander Helene is either a uh, dilettante or a Renaissance man, depending on whom you ask. A musician, athlete, artist, and law school graduate. Alexander has always been attracted to fantastical tales since they tend to do a better job of explaining how the world works than just about anything else. Uh, again, he lives in New England with his wife and child. And uh, the book, the book's description, which I recommend everyone picking up, and you can check out Alexander's webpage at www.amatopia.wordpress.com. Um, and uh, oops, there's my, if I can hear uh, my. That's her daughter's favorite song, right? <laughs> it's my subdivision's uh, 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 ringtone. Um, as it says about his book on Amazon, there's nothing average about the average Rush fan. Rush, the legendary Canadian progressive rock trio, has a legion of devoted fans. But uh, what is it about the band that inspires such loyal and dedicated fan base? And what is it about these fans that has created the powerful bond between artists and audience? The story of these fans has never been told until now. Exclusive interviews, including Donna Halper, the woman who broke Rush in the United States, Ed Stenger, proprietor of Rushesofan.com, one of the biggest Rush fan sites on the internet, detailed survey results, which I think sets his book apart, actual survey results illuminating what makes hundreds of Rush fans tick, an exploration of interest, politics, faith, and philosophy of the millions of people across the globe who find meaning in the music and lyrics of Rush, in-depth fan pro t- profiles in the book where Rush fans tell the stories about what this band means to them, concert memories, personal anecdotes, and fan favorite songs and albums. 
Dreamers and Misfits pre presents a celebration of Russia's music and the fans who inspired and propelled the band to such dizzying heights. Uh, well, listen, what more can you say? The man put out a book about Rush, and we love him for that. Uh, everybody, uh, welcome Alexander, author Alexander Helene, to Two Guys Talking Rush. Well, hey, uh, so thank you for uh, for joining us on Two Guys Talking Rush. And, uh, you know, our podcast is, is sort of different. We try to, uh, you know, uh, talk to folks who uh, who have been influenced by the band in some way to 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 do certain things uh, in the arts or uh, uh, in science, uh, you know, wh wh wherever wherever Rush sort of takes them. Uh, uh, and uh, you, you've written a book about Rush, and um, obviously you're on here about that. But you know, when we talk to authors, we like to get into the origin story of the author, like sort of like where you're from, and and then how uh, from that early time, how that journey pushed you into the band and the focus on the band. So maybe you could yeah, take like how, how did the how did the long strange trip begin for you? Exactly. Yeah. So the long, strange trip into being a fan, or you mean into writing? Yeah, or into, well, into maybe into writing. Like, what, what were you like as a as a kid, and uh, where'd you grow up? Yep. So I I grew up not too far from uh, from you, John. I'm from. Uh, I grew up in New Hampshire, central New Hampshire, and I lived there for you know until I ended up moving to Boston for college. But I'd always been into two things. I mean, I was always into books and reading fantasy and sci-fi and things like that and I was always into music um, my dad really got me into rock and roll music me and my older brother and we went to play guitars together and things like that and I always had it in my head that someday I'd like to I'd like to write and I'd like to play in bands um, so those things didn't come into fruition until a lot later in life but um, when I got into what brought me into being a fan of Rush it's probably similar to what a lot of people tell you is that I started playing the bass guitar. Um, I started playing before I actually got into Rush's music and Getty Lee as a bass player in particular. Um, but I just remember I'd always read about this band Rush and bass magazines. I hear songs on the radio occasionally, but you know, my, my, my dad, while he was into rock and roll, he wasn't too big into prog rock. So he was always kind of like, ah, I can't stand this guy's voice. And Never really thought too much of it, but I had some friends growing up who'd have, uh, you know, Rush albums. I remember one guy in, uh, was in the eighth grade. He had, he had a mini disc player. I don't know if you remember those. Rush. And he had, oh, yeah. he had, he had hold, uh, he had hold your fire, and he had a show of hands. And I remember listening to Force Ten, uh, that made a pretty big impact. And then I remember listening to he played me the version of Spirit of Radio from a show of hands. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. But then, you know, he put something else on. I think it was Pink Floyd. And we were listening to that instead. And I didn't think too much of Rush. Um, you know, and I would hear, I would hear uh, songs like Limelight and Tom Sawyer on the radio, but never really focused on it. Um, and I just remember one day hearing, hearing Limelight in the radio. I was with my, my mother. I was like 14 or 15, waiting for my sister to finish up some after school thing. And, and Limelight came on. And it just, I don't know, something really clicked. And I just remember from that point on asking a bunch of people, like, what's a good Rush album to get? And everybody would tell me moving pictures. I remember reading an article in Bass Player Magazine, which had a little, like, retrospective review of moving pictures. So I bought that when I was, I think, 17. And uh, it just, it just so you, floored me. So you went, yes. to high, you went to high school in New Hampshire? You look relatively... You look relatively young. I mean, you look like a young. How, do you mind me asking your age or what, what year you graduated high school? No, no, I'm I'm uh, going to be forty in a couple months. I graduated nice. in nice. two thousand. So. Oh, very cool, very cool. A so a what, child, my God, <laughs> a baby. Uh, so <laughs> a baby. Uh, so, uh, what was your high school uh, music scene like? Because we talked to folks all, of all different ages, and it's very interesting to me to learn about uh, those years because these are the years we sort of hang on to. You know, I'm like on a classic metal uh, uh, phase right now. I'm looking back. I'm yep. like, I'm having a midlife crisis or something, you know. But uh, you know, I put it, it's on rotation. So, what were you listening to? What was in your rotation of music back then, man? Classic rock, the stuff that my dad liked, yeah. uh, Zeppelin, The Who. Yeah. the Beatles brother got me into Frank Zappa. So, um, and then, you know, towards the end of high school, that would have been the late nineties. It was, you know, the guys were starting to get back into old Metallica. So we were, a lot of us guys, we were listening to a lot of that older kind of thrash metal and then a lot of skate punk. Cause you know, yeah. that was just, 
that was just the era. And right. then, totally. um, you know, into that. And, and the weird thing is, is that you wouldn't, you wouldn't think it, but um, a lot of those guys, I remember a lot of those, you know, central New Hampshire, you know, skateboarder, surfboarder kind of guys were musicians. And a lot of those guys were Rush fans. So when I started listening to Rush, a lot of those guys were like, oh yeah. Oh man, I love those guys. Yeah. Oh, this is, you know, this is the permanent waves is so good. And there was a lot, you know, that they, they just kind of scratched a lot of those similar musical itches, which it's kind of really interesting to think about now, 20 years later that, you know, like all these like snowboarder Hesher dudes were rocking out to, you know, grace under pressure or whatever. And, sure. but there you go. I mean, no, that, that's cool, man. Yeah. It's funny. I, I grew up in Boston. I'm, I'm originally from Somerville. That's where I grew up okay. for my, all my entire life. And then I'm, I moved to New Hampshire. I sort of followed my uh, education up the, 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 the North shore, uh, ending up uh, here in New Hampshire, but um, I'll be out and about in New Hampshire. And, and for some reason, oddly, New Hampshire still, retains that like era of rock and roll like I'll just, people drive by and you hear like slaughter you know you, 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 it's funny man you know you go to hampton beach there's still like metalheads walking around you know and uh uh it's just funny that you know each state has its own little kind of vibe and, and all those things how did you how did you get into writing what, what was your first book and what describe your writing style and what you're interested in yeah sure um my so what really got me into writing and again this is you know you probably have a million people say this it was you know J.R.R. Tolkien um you know that really that really did it for me um I kind of it kind of snowballed from there um a lot of the uh more of your like late 80s fantasy writers at that point then you know like a lot of um you know Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman I I never played too too much D&D as a kid but they wrote a bunch of these Dragonlance books which um I enjoyed and then that got me into, um, you know, C.S. Lewis. And then going forward, some of the newer authors like Robert Jordan, Tad Williams, um, you know, George R. R. Martin, guys like that. And uh, I, was, I was mostly a fantasy guy for a while. Um, and I'd read history books, too. And then I got into, much later in life, a lot of the old, old sci-fi stuff. You know, Jack Vance, Edgar Rice Burroughs, um, guys like that, um, even uh, non non-fantasy non-sci-fi stuff but authors like conan doyle and um you know i decided to try my hand at writing i don't know i was 25 26 like fine let's sit down and finish something and it ended up ended up being like a detective story of you know for of all things not really at all the kind of stuff that i read um and i would just peck away at stuff over the years i think i had written about seven or eight full-length full-length novels that'll never see the light of day until i wrote one um, that I thought was worthy of being published. And I did that in, uh, in 2018. And, Congratulations. you know, it was, thank you. It was more of, you know, of, uh, of urban fantasy type, as they call it, which is, you know, like it takes place in the modern day, but it has these fantastical elements and have just gone from there. Um, and then I, I made the, the in, in retrospect, it was a good decision. At the time, it seemed like a really stupid decision to try to write this book about Rush at the same time as I was you know, writing other stuff. And, like working watching my kids having a life so um it's definitely a, a history of biting off more than i can chew but yeah so what, what inspired <laughs> you to are. write a write a, i mean it's a sort of a stupid question of of course we know that you no 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 you have to you have to love something in order to write about it in many ways well sometimes we have to earn a living and write about things we don't want to write about but uh you're independently taking on a project about a band that you are suggesting to everyone that you love what inspires you to kind of get right into it and gives you and what it's what sort of story are you thinking about when you are going to put together a book about rush yeah so that that um so kind of like a a, a lot of people when when neil died a year ago it was it was weird because of all the the celebrities i've been a fan of we couldn't stop thinking about this individual that we only really knew through his, his music and his words. And it, the thoughts just snowballed from there. I just kept, I just kept thinking about why um, his death had such an effect on me and why the band's music had such an effect on me. And uh, I had it just in, in the, the real impetus to actually write a book beyond just thinking, oh, it would be interesting to figure out what other people's stories are about this was I read an article that Donna Halper wrote in her uh, hometown newspaper, the Quincy Patriot Ledger. And all this time, I hadn't realized that she was a New Englander and she still lived in the area outside of Boston. 
So <laughs> I just, I sent her an email um, asking, you know, introducing myself and just asking if she'd like to chat. And she was very happy to, she was really cool. Like a really nice lady, really gracious. She loves interacting with the fans. You can just see that. And um, we ended up having a chat for about 45 minutes uh, last February. And that coincided with this, this request for, you know, the survey I put out for fans. And I had a bunch of questions about, you know, demographic information because I just had it in my head to, to build a profile of like, who's your typical fan? Is there a typical Rush fan? And then I wanted to get also other like stories and memories and what the band meant to people from people. So she helped with that regard. And um, I also kind of had a, just, a, I just emailed um, this guy, Ed Stenger out of the blue. I'm sure you're familiar with Ed. He runs the Rushes of Band blog and to see if he could just mm -hmm. put the word out. And he was, he was very helpful. I, I interviewed him too for the book. And from there, I ended up with just like 650 some odd responses from people that I had to, to sort through um, read through and try to construct a narrative around it. What um, was the What was the narrative? How would you describe your book then to people? So the book the book has the book has um it, there's three main <laughs> questions I was trying to answer. Is there a typical Russian and if such a, um, because there are a lot of stereotypes, you know, that's uh, you know nerds who mostly guys who are into sci-fi and fantasy, probably scientists. Is that true or not? I don't know. I mean, I check some of the boxes myself. You know, other boxes I don't check, but I figured it'd be interesting to figure that out. Um, the second question was why does the band mean so much to people and then um, because it's a crazy fan phenomenon and it's been going on for 40 years and then number three it was why did neil's death affect people so much well i mean one of the things that you said like you would you would ask like what is the typical rush fan and uh you know we've had we've actually had donna on the show a few times uh Oops. she and uh john work uh work together on his uh thesis uh, oh, so, wow. yeah so yeah. yeah there's a she's a good friend she's she's good people um she is. but you know what what she always says and i certainly agree is that there is no typical rush fan it's everybody and you know i mean yes there's a stereotype for sure uh that i i certainly conform to as as closely as possible but uh you know she's you know as as the history has gone on in the years have passed it's become more of a multi-generational thing yeah uh it's become you you do see women at the shows you know like yep. that kind of thing it's the it may have been that like 30 years ago or 40 years ago it was true that it was just all dudes total sausage yep. party you know but it's not like that anymore and um you know i mean try, trying to you know i mean there are certain kinds of rush fans who will see the the band 120 times yeah uh, yeah so i mean to me that's more of like if you wanted to talk about like a stereotypical fan is like someone who has seen them a lot someone yep. who has suffered a lot to go see them uh someone who has toiled greatly to see them uh they're not just some normal band where you just wait until they they come to town you know the, you know the, these fans will put themselves through stuff i wouldn't do for anybody to be you know to be able to see them 12 hours away um yeah. you know you just you don't you don't see that very often with really with the grateful dead is the band i keep comparing it to it just in terms of how far the fan base is willing to go just to be around these guys and just to hear what they have to do obviously the music is completely different and you know the behavior is a little different but uh you know what we've what we've really found is that if, if there is a typical rush fan what it's really about is their dedication it's not about it's not about a demographic it's not that it's about these are the guys this is it this is it for me and um and also that uh, a year ago when neil passed that they were utterly devastated and could could not continue there was that also that's that's also part of being a rush fan any story, but, uh, any stories that uh, kind of, uh, Dan, well said, man, um, totally. And I just want to ask, uh, before I forget, any stories that, <laughs> that stick out, uh, that just, that are so memorable uh, that you learned uh, maybe uh, while writing the book or just uh, something you still think about? Yeah. So there were more than one individual who said that the music helped them overcome suicidal thoughts basically yeah. and they and and it was a good number of people pointed specifically to the presto album as i'm sure you can imagine but it wasn't just the past there were there were other other songs and lyrics that helped people out 
Um, Hold Your Fire was another one that a lot of people said, even though I was younger when that came out and it might not have grabbed me initially the same way like a 2112 did or a movie pictures or what have you. I'm um, really helping them through some tough times. So there are some powerful stories about, about Presto helping get people through some very hard times. Um, there, were, there, was, there was one gentleman who um, was deployed for many years to Iraq and Afghanistan, and he uh, had a tough time, obviously, a tough time readjusting to civilian life, but he was able to see a rush show, I believe it was in Washington, D.C., and he said that once the band started playing and he had seats up front and he said, you know, Getty looked at him and like nodded and he said he just he just had a feeling like everything's going to be OK. And it was like sort of his his, you know, baptism back into regular life. And he was able to put a lot of what he went through behind him. Um, that that one stuck with me. And then the, the, the last one that I could think of off the top of my head is there was there was a woman who said that they had their um, her, and her husband had. I forgot which lyrics, but but lyrics from the bands on the inside of their wedding rings, which I thought was kind of cute. Oh wow! Yeah, Dan, I wonder if there are any babies born at a rush show. Uh, <laughs> oh, both, not both, at, not both at Dan show, and I, but... both Dan and I, have written books about Woodstock, and that is that yeah. is the common. So I wonder, any babies born at a rush show? If uh, you uh, if you see a bunch of kids named Cygnus all of a sudden, then I guess <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, exactly, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, that's so funny, man. So what what comes up as the favorite album uh, in your view? You you sort of have a lot of data, right? You you, yep. you you do these interviews, and that is your data, and the data is treated however you want it. But you know, there's a lot of sort of um, information that sort of rises uh, with regard to. Uh, and we asked that question a lot on the show. We, you know, favorite yeah. favorite album that comes up in conversation. It, how about for you? What was the consensus of uh, of those albums? So the consensus, unsurprisingly, was Moving Pictures. Um, not by as wide a margin as I thought. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but um, it was Moving Pictures um, for sure. And then the other ones that I think the the top five, I believe it was it was Moving Pictures at the top in Hemispheres. And permanent waves in 2112, I believe, were all there. And I want to say, um, gosh, was it Signals or Farewell to Kings? It was that they, they, they were all clustered around that sweet spot, that you know, 1977, right. 1976, 1982 sweet spot. Um, but but moving pictures, even though most people's favorite songs weren't from moving pictures, that was the consensus album. Interesting. That everybody yeah. seemed to like. Interesting and um, understandable. Yeah, totally. Um, do you um, uh, can you talk about uh, how long it took you to prep to like what you how you prepped to write something like this? Do you collect the information first, then sort it, and then immerse it into some sort of narrative, or how do you how do you work as a writer, especially with a project like this? If you were on the View right now, what we so would be saying is, what is your process? <laughs> What is my process? Um, what is your process? I, I yeah. don't I don't outline too, too heavily. I like to have loose outlines, a, a, a basic idea of where I'm going, and then I like to give myself room to, to wing it. So I would have a, a, a structure, and I would just start writing. And when yeah. I needed, when I came to spots where I needed something to support an assertion I made, I would either look it up right there, or I'd make a note of it. Um, some days I would just research, research articles, research, uh, you know, newspapers, watch interviews, watch videos, watch documentaries. Some other days I would go through all the data, especially the chapters where it was, um, those first few chapters in the book where it was, you know, each chapter I kind of had a stereotype and then I wanted to see if fans actually lived up to that. So those, for those chapters, it was just a lot of going through the spreadsheet, organizing things. And then what I would do is I would go back and plug it into my structure, but um, I ended up writing a couple chapters that I wasn't intending on writing, like the whole chapter about how the press treated Rush fans. Um, that's at the beginning of the book. Uh, that I just had the idea, I had written about four or five chapters. And then that the idea for that came to me as I was reading these interviews. I was like, oh my gosh, I wonder if there's more about that because it just struck me as interesting, right? Like I, I can't think of any other band that the fans were attacked as much uh, as this band. So um, that chapter just came into being through through doing research. So um, the process was, you know, the my, my I guess my my writing process in general, it's 
there's not so much, um, you know, like, oh, I'm a heavy, uh, you know, I outline, I do this, or I have a blueprint I follow. It's just, you know, you got to work at it. I just make sure I work at it a little bit each day. Um, you know, I'm not getting paid to do this, but still I try to have some kind of disciplined schedule. And just the more I do it, the more likely I am to, I mean, it sounds really cliche, but you know, the more I do it, the more likely I am to finish, finish a project. Yeah. 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 Most definitely. man. Well, I understand. Like you guys with the show, I mean, you know, if you, you didn't just get at it every day and get book guests and work on your production and everything, it just, it would never happen. So, you know, you just got to right. do it. Yeah, totally. A lot, of, yeah. a lot of people, a lot of people, I think, think it just sort of magically appears. I think they think the same thing with books too. That it's they just show up one day, and they don't recognize that there's like a lot of runway that you need beforehand. There's a lot of toil that goes into it. Yep. Uh, but you know, I mean, I I get mad about it sometimes, but I can't really expect people to appreciate everything that goes into it. You know. Yeah. Uh, yep. How long? How long were you working on it? All like from start to finish? Would you say? Um, from so this um, about ten months. Um, I started writing it, doing some research, and just getting my thoughts together right after Neil died. Nice. So around ten, around ten months total. Yeah. Yeah. I would say about nice. ten months. Yeah. Nice. nice. But had you? But I mean, had you been planning to do something like this, and then Neil passed, or Neil passed, and you were like, "I better do something." No, Neil passed, and then the idea came to me just a couple days after. Um, I just started thinking about it. Now, when when did I actually start writing? Probably February. There's a book out that's called uh, uh, a day, This Day. In, what's what's Richard Houghton's book? Do you know Richard Houghton? He put out a book. He's an English writer. He put out a book on just fan stories. I think it's straight out, uh, you know, just about fan stories. Yeah. It sounds like your book has um it's on my list to read uh i have a long list of, of books i'm reading but uh, it sounds like your book has more of a narrative more of a story to it with regard to structure rather than just an introduction into a fan uh, a fan chapter and then the fans tell the story you actually sort of have a, a voice in the book yeah yeah and that was one thing that i i debated you know do I, how much of myself do i want to put into this um oh. I, but I decided that, um, you know, considering how much of a community and a, like a family, the, the, the Rush fan world is, I figured, you know, I'll give my kind of fan experience just as an introduction or kind of interspersed with um, each chapter and then uh, get into either the data about fans or the fan stories as the, the meat of each chapter. So the book starts out, excuse me more of conversationally and then it gets a little bit more you know serious towards the end as we get into some of the weightier topics like what the band means to people and neil's death and i did that intentionally to kind of you know soften the reader up and then so by the time they get to the heavy stuff at the end they're a little bit more you know the, the way was paved and then the the last couple chapters you know you'll, you'll notice john um i get more into just taking big chunks of what the fans said and, and sharing it because it was a lot I mean it was so good I, I would have loved to have included everything but that I tried that and it made the book something like 700 pages and yeah that was a bit much um so yeah I tried to I tried to have a little bit more of a like make it a story before getting into the fan stuff and there are some fan I have some fan profiles in there too and some interviews of fans um at the end international fans do you, do you speak to fans in other countries as well I got I got feedback from fans from other countries, but uh, the ones I interviewed were American fans. Yeah, interesting. Okay, yeah, uh, interesting. So, how's the feedback been? Speaking of feedback, how has the response been to your book, and where can people find it? Find it. Yep, so you can find it on Amazon. You just type in uh, "Dreamers and Misfits" and it'll it'll pop up. Um, the response has been generally good. I've had people say that. Uh, you know, one one thing people say is that they love reading the fan stories. Um, it's and they can they can relate. I've had a lot of people who answered my survey get a kick out of seeing their you know their words in the book, and and they 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 enjoyed being a part of that. Um, I think it was it was awesome working with all these fans and everything in the book. I had permission to use too, um, so cool. I didn't 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 yeah I didn't put anything. And people there's plenty of stuff people didn't want me to put in the book. They're like you can make me anonymous or just use my data don't use my stories but you're fine um you know the the it's been good because nobody's really seems to have got, gone into it expecting
expecting it to be a biography about the band because right. it's not. I do go right. over some stuff about the band and I've had some, you'll see some of the reviews on Amazon say like, well, there's, you know, interesting look at the fans. I didn't learn anything new about the band. And that's, you know, that's, that's a fair, that's a fair criticism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, that's, Oh, you know, I, do, I don't, I don't think it is fair criticism oh, actually. Cause yeah. you say explicitly that this is about the fans, uh, but people don't like to, well, that, I mean, the proper thing to do is in, inter <laughs> in an introduction uh, 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 or, um, you know, in some other way that you would explain to the reader how the book is designed and how it's to be read. And if no yep. if yeah. people skip that part, then they start to make judgments that are unfounded, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, that's, but... that's, that's out of your hands. To, yeah. You know, you can, you, you can only put the print in the book. You yep. cannot control what the person does with it. Yep. Once you give them the, you know, they could use the book to prop up a coffee table. You, you know, it's once you've written it, it, it's gone. There's nothing you can do about it. But I mean, I, I know for books I've done, there were a lot of things where I felt like I really spelled this out, really spelled this out. And then I would still get people coming back to me who just hadn't really... <sighs> They had they had read it like toilet. I wish style. I wish Dan <laughs> didn't spell this. I wish Dan didn't spell this out so much and just get right to the. There's always going to be a complaint, right? My, my well, they, I mean, people tend people I find tend to just sort of take it cafeteria style. The books that you write, unless it's like you know fiction, very immersive, linear, immersive. They, they like to yeah, they just like to flip through, look at the look at the pictures, that sort of thing. But then they'll ask, they'll say things like, how could you not cover this? Or how could you not cover this? And it's like, I did cover it. It's in, it's in the book. And then they'll be like, oh, okay, well, I guess I missed that part. So you can't do anything about it. And you just, you have to kind of accept that that's, that's how people consume books these days. So yeah, that was, interesting. That was my experience anyway. Yeah. My, my favorite though was I had one there's one one star review on Amazon and it's nice. it cracked me up because it said um it said sad and it said the the pages started falling out the binding was bad too bad because I liked what I read one star and I was like <laughs> that's hysterical wow. like that's not that's not um not, you're that's nothing physical, about the writing yeah, that's so a just... review of the physical quality of the book yeah but well, not yeah. like the actual book no that's not, so that's like writing. that's like one star buy me a and kindle People are very brave about leaving one star reviews. They're much less brave when you're when you're like, oh, can I ask you some questions about that? Hey man, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is your opportunity to, to to connect with that one star guy and and uh, you know kind of hug each other and fix the problem, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, we'll hug just, it out, dude. Yeah, exactly. Just send the book back. Amazon will send you another one. They and will fi and fix the review. Okay, buddy. Uh, yeah. That's the way we. That's the way we handle the two guys talking to Rush. Well, have you ever seen the band before live? First show I went to see them. Uh, show them was in um, 2002, I believe, in, in Mansfield, Mass, at the uh, the old Great Woods. Um, I saw them on the R30 tour there nice. also in 2004, and then 2000. Excuse me, 2007. I saw them there on the first leg of the Snakes and Arrows tour, and then. Yeah like an idiot they came up to new england in several spots uh, several stops in new england on um time machine on clockwork angels and on the r40 tour and i didn't go because i was like god i can't spare the money i don't have time yeah, yeah, yeah. when you when you were talking though about um that there were you had talked to people who like rush had stopped them from have you know they'd had suicidal thoughts and uh and rush had sort of helped them to cope and that's yeah. sort of i i've been through that with them many times and uh, well before uh the presto album uh just something about like the sound of the music was very comforting to me uh you know and the fact that you can kind of the lyrics are you have, you have to work a little bit for them yep yep it gets you it gets you out of your head and it gets you know if you're if i mean i may be saying a little too much here but i've i've been in that situation myself sure and the hardest part of it is getting out of it and you just you want nothing but to escape your own mindset and the music really took me away from that and um even more so i would say than than the lyrics did so yeah, yeah you, you feel good after listening to it you do you, you feel do. better that's, yeah that's for sure. I, i'm not capable of feeling good but i felt better definitely feel better yeah. yeah yeah that's awesome well, uh, we want to thank you for coming on the show. And, um, you know, we always ask this of our, of our guests. 
if you could tell us what your top five Rush albums are. Yeah, yeah, I will. Um, I'm going to cheat, and I have a tie for number one. It's uh, Moving Pictures, because it's the first one I got as a fan, and then Clockwork Angels, because I, I seriously think that it just, it's like the perfect capstone to their career. Number three was Hemispheres. Number four was Permanent Waves. Okay. Oh, okay. And I'm going to have to say number five, and again, I'm in that sweet spot all the fans do, but number five, I'm going to have to say Signals. Well, I've, I like that you call that the sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I kind of consider that the sweet spot also, but what we've learned since doing this show is that uh, Clockwork Angels is like everybody's favorite or among everybody's favorite albums, which yeah. is really, which is unusual for a band that late in their career. Usually by that point, it's, you know, it's a little stale. It's a little dried yeah. up, but they, not those guys, you know. No, they, they didn't lose a step, you know. Not a, no, and I mean, my God, and like you said, you know, you want to you want to talk about the, like the perfect capstone to a career. I mean, you, what what else are you going to do? That's, you know, exactly. That's so, so uh, Alex, where can folks find out more about what you're doing and what your next project is? Yep, sure. Um, they can. I got a I got a blog. It's called Amatopia, A M A T O P I A at WordPress dot com. That's the best place. And um, if you just look me up on Amazon, it's got all my books right there. So cool. that's probably the best. Okay. Got any new projects coming down the pike or what? Yeah, I'm I'm um, I'm working on uh, book three of uh, sort of a Sword and Planet trilogy. Um, nice. The first one, yeah, the first two are out. Just put the second one out in December. Congratulations on your achievements and uh, your, your book. And um, we want to thank you very much for uh, coming on to uh, Two Guys Talking Rush. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for having me. This is great, guys. I appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. You got it. it. Ex excellent show. Well, Dan, Alexander Helene, uh, great guy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even better book. And uh, we're glad to have him on the show. What'd you think Absolutely. of that interview? Um, he's, he's like us in many ways. Uh, you know, because I, we, you know, we feel that we have, uh, we owe something to the fans and that it's sort of like, giving back in a lot of ways. And I, I felt the same way with what he was doing that, you know, besides just being a fan himself, he wanted to spotlight all these people who've made all this possible. Fans get forgotten frequently. And I, I like anybody who wants to pay some attention to them and give them, give them some time. Rush fans, especially, are a breed apart, as we all know. If anyone deserves a book or multiple books, it's them. So... Well. I'm glad yeah, you put well, one out there. Yeah, very well put. And, uh, you know, disclaimer, disclaimer, uh, when we were interviewing Alexander, he was having some difficulty with his internet connection. And uh, to, another disclaimer, disclaimer, if anybody that's been listening to the show, I, I have construction going on in my home. And I, unfortunately, I don't have a private studio yeah. to go to to escape it. But uh, it happens. And, uh, and, and I'm just an annoying person. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. they put up with that too. So, <laughs> and, and just plain out annoying. You know? <laughs> That's all right, Dan. You're a likable guy. I'm likable enough. <laughs> well, folks, there it is. Uh, another uh, episode of Two Guys Talking Rush, episode 34. Uh, you know what can I say? We just keep trying. That's all we can. That's all we can. Do. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying, man. We're trying. <laughs> I think Neil said that one time. In fact, in really. One of his that's, that's all you can do is try. I, yep. I think I think that is a direct quote from Neil. Um, you know, uh, w what else is there if you don't try? He was not wrong. And here, here are two guys talking Rush. We try. Two guys trying. Two guys just, trying to talk about Rush. Yeah, we're trying. Trying. Absolutely. <laughs> well, there it is, folks. Another killer episode of Two Guys Talking Rush. My name's John Kane. I am the delightful Dan Bucks band. What can I say, folks? Rush rules. rules. Two guys, two guys are talking. Rush two, 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 two guys, two guys are talking. Rush two, two guys are talking. Rush two, two guys, two guys are talking. Rush, 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 two guys. Two guys.